Welcome to Build Your Dream Network. I'm Kelly Hoey. I see people struggling to connect effectively all the time. So I created this podcast to help you master your network building needs. Whether you're seeking a new job, looking for a promotion, or scaling your business, you need a network and you're in the right place to get the advice you need. And don't worry, my advice is real. It's actionable and practical because it's the advice I follow and is what has transformed my career from the traditional to the unexpected. So let's get started. So today on the podcast, I'm going to have a conversation on a rather, um, well, a depressing topic, but with a very funny lady. The topic is rejection, and my guest is New Yorker cartoonist Liza Donnelly. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. The fear of rejection and pain of rejection, uh, listeners, it's real. Um, It's not just about silly nerves and anxiety. Constant rejection can lead to low self-esteem and depression. Researchers have also found that areas in our brain light up when we experience rejection. The same areas that light up when we experience physical pain. There's a very good reason we use expressions such as a punch in the gut, a knife to the heart when describing rejection. Come on, let's admit it. Some of us avoid career fairs, networking events, applying for jobs, doing those networking things because of a fear of rejection. And just to say that Liza and I know and feel your pain, and this episode is going to provide some ideas on how to address that. But now back to my guest, Liza. Rejection as an emotional wound is one Liza is intimately familiar with. In October 2019, Liza published a piece in the New Yorker magazine titled How I Became a New Yorker Cartoonist. In that piece, Liza shared details not only on how she came to be a cartoonist, but also the harsh reality of regular rejection in her profession. So Liza, you began, I want to go back to that article and kind of walk through some of the details there. You began submitting cartoons to The New Yorker in 1977. When did you sell your first one to them? Two years later, roughly. Okay. And um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, so like, what's the process? What's the process of selling cartoons into a publication? I'm an expert on on rejection, along with all the other New York cartoonists you've ever met. (laughs) It'd be interesting to see us all in one room. So... You typically send in what we call a batch of cartoons every week, and that could be 8 to 20, depending on your own personal editing style, you know, whether you edit yourself before the pen hits the paper or after. So I usually submit 8, 6 to 8. And um, the New Yorker either that week either buys one or they don't. Sometimes they'll buy two, which is rare in my case, but some people do sell two in one week. Um, And then you just start all over again the next week and do the same thing. Six new ideas. Uh, so you learn to deal with rejection. You know, you have these favorite cartoons that you've done that week, and you think, well, why didn't they buy that? Um, so that's the process. So in the course of a year, how many cartoons are you like drawing and submitting in total? Well, you do the math, Kelly. I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> well, that's why I went to law school. I, I went to law school, <laughs> so I didn't have to do the math. Okay, so you're six to eight a week for 52 weeks, or you know, well, you re- take weeks off and oh. you sometimes resubmit things. So, okay, yeah. so well, it's a Somebody lot of do the math. That's a lot, lot of cartoons. And yeah. how many typically do you sell in a year? Uh, maybe one a month. Wow, wow, yeah, yeah. That's maybe two, two a month. It, it varies, but so, uh, yeah, and that's fairly average for us. There's people who sell more, and there's people who sell less. Okay, so, so so one a month. So I'm going to say rejection is kind of a professional job hazard. This is uh, right. This is true. Wow. You, so you sold your first cartoon in 1979. Um, and I noted from the article, the success of celebrating it was a bit solitary. Yeah, it's, um, I was new in the business, so I didn't, I don't know if I knew that many cartoonists at the time, although that's sort of irrelevant. I'll explain in a minute. Um, and I didn't have a boyfriend at the time. And, um, it's also, so, so who do you, who do you tell when you first sell that, that first cartoon you've been hoping to be a cartoonist for most of your life? Um, you got to call somebody, you got to celebrate. So I think I probably called my father. Um, but really it, it's, it's something that is very personal that the, the, uh, the desire to be that is very personal and, and it's, it's only a big deal really to you. I mean, everybody will say, oh, that's great. And then they'll go on. And then it's like, it's not, you know, you're not winning the Nobel Prize. You're just selling a cartoon to the New Yorker, yeah. which is big for us, those of us who want to do it. 
um, it just becomes a part of your life. It becomes who you are. You're a New York, New York cartoonist now. And then you move on. So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of interesting, and that's sort of that part of it. And I want to come to the community and, and discuss that. You know, when we live in a day and age where, you know, so much is shared, um, yeah. you know, online, and there's an element of things that are appropriate, you know, mm-hmm. to keep in inside, uh, to keep, you know, off social. They don't need to be celebrated in these big ways for, you know, a variety of reasons. Um, talk about the community of cartoonists mm-hmm. and, and why it is that unwritten rule that you never talk about whether well, you, or not you've sold a cartoon. Yeah. Well, Kelly, I don't know if that's true anymore in the community. It's evolved into something that was that is different than when I started. But when I started, we really didn't share if we sold a cartoon that week because we wanted to be together. We would have lunch. A relatively small group of us would have lunch every week after we submitted our cartoons. And it was a pleasant lunch, a social, fun, funny, kidding around kind of lunch. And you, you didn't always talk business. It was an understanding among all of us that this is a crazy, nutty job we've decided to take on and it's tough and um, we're all equals here and um, you don't need to brag about the fact you sold that week or whatever. So that's the unwritten sort of behavior. I think now it's a little less like that. I think people do share and they, well, actually, I should say when I was starting out, there was a group of cartoonists that would get together and work on ideas together and share their batches and their roughs. Um, I never did that because for me, it's a very personal thing. So I think there's some of that going on now, and I do think that they share on, they have a Slack channel. They, I say they. I mean, the younger, newer cartoonists have a Slack channel, and I'm on it, but I don't participate that much. To talk about the rejection and the sales and, the, you know, what works and what doesn't. I mean, it's it's such a mysterious world. You don't know what's going to work. You don't know what's going to sell. You don't know because humor is subjective. You don't know. Um, so I think it's a sharing thing that that is important. Yeah. Well, it's not like there's an algorithm picking what's funny. It's, no. There's, there's an editor. Uh, you know, two editors, two right? editors. Yeah. There's there's someone, you know, yeah. so or some some ones who are making the selection. So mm-hmm. but yeah, that's sort of interesting. Uh, maybe I'm not surprised that a younger generation would be more willing to share some of this information growing up in a kind of a different way. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe that helps them with this sort of the sting of rejection. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like you am one of these people that I want to say kind of keeps that work product quiet. Mm-hmm. Um as opposed to being someone who's always shared it in a well, for me, open yeah. Situation. I mean, if you're a creative person, sometimes it's ha- it's hard to share that that process with other people. It's very personal. That's just my approach. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't disagree with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so these other cartoonists that you you know and you work with, and uh, you have this community. You know, they're colleagues, but they're also competitors in this mm-hmm. kind of crazy system um, that is kind of stacked against all of you in many ways, but how do you balance that tension? Um, Talk a little more about Mm -hmm. that. That's actually probably why we didn't talk about sales back then, I think, is because we know we're direct competitors. And if you talk about sales, then you end up being more conscious on the surface that this cartoonist is selling more than you are, even though you kind of know it. Because you see their work in there, <laughs> and yours is not in there. So anyway, um, <laughs> it's kind of public when it's in yeah, the New Yorker. Yeah. Like who's sold? But, but still, it, yeah, trying to keep it uh, on the down low while you're hanging out. Um, we rarely talk about it together. Although, uh, as you know, Kelly, I'm married to another New Yorker cartoonist, so <laughs> we can't avoid but talk about it. And um, it's what we live and breathe. I mean, we're, we're married because of the New Yorker. That's how we met. So we live and breathe the magazine. And plus, my husband's name is Michael Maslin. He writes a blog about New Yorker cartoons, historically and, and currently. So he's very knowledgeable about all the new people, and, and he's very knowledgeable about the history, as am I, because I wrote a book called Funny Ladies about the women cartoonists of the magazine uh, from 1925 to the present. So we talk about it all the time, and I think that sharing um, for us personally is crucial. I would say there's there's an element of thinking about other spouses who either have, I would say, careers together or careers in the same field and are competitors. I don't know how you, you know, people who silo it so they're like, oh, we don't talk about that with the spouse. I don't know how you how you would do that, um, yeah. particularly. Although in, we don't really talk about our individual work, our, you know, our individual cartoons that you, much. You don't hash your ideas by him before you submit no. them? No. <laughs> Nor does he with me. <laughs> Perfect match. That's because we started out doing this on our own anyway before we met. So I think we have our processes. Yeah. And Forty- mine's mine and his is his. So. Yeah, yeah. so you support each other that way. That's mm-hmm. a perfect, perfect union as far as I can see it. But I think I have to say you really should, in any kind of difficult endeavor, uh, find people to support you emotionally. 
That's so important, particularly for women, to find a partner that is there for you yeah, um, yeah. and understands what you're going through. And I think having a community beyond the professional community, the friends who understand the roller coaster of what, you know, your your career is not just the hours, but the emotion, mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing that there's one day a week that it is really highly emotional and you are submitting yeah. a manila envelope or claiming one back from, mm -hmm. as you said, the surly receptionist. Yeah, right. <laughs> that doesn't happen really anymore. It's different. Well, we, we submit at least... I do through email. Oh. You can go in and meet with the editor and talk with her. It's a woman now who's the cartoon editor. Oh, I'll awesome. talk with Emma about your cartoons, um, and she'll give you feedback. And I've done that a few times, but generally I send them in via email. So we, there's a new barrier to uh, <laughs> you know to the face of rejection. The, the description in that in your New oh, York art, you. and I just sort of feeling it's like going to the principal's office every week. When yeah, it was. <laughs> The New Yorker has a different feel than it used to in that way, because the New Yorker seemed very, well, maybe because I was younger, too. It just seemed like this hallowed Oz, you know, that you were approaching and bowing yeah. down and yeah. <laughs> handing your little manila envelope in. So, yeah, there's something about that, those kind of traditions. Anyway, so with rejection being so constant, um, how do you deal, like, deal with rejection? You know, you've been a cartoonist for 40 years, mm -hmm. and, like, does it ever get easier? You learn to manage it. It doesn't really get easier. You learn to manage it, and you learn to do a few things. First of all, you look ahead. You try not to look back on the cartoons that didn't get accepted or the, the work that wasn't bought, um, and look to the next batch. That's what you try to do. <laughs> uh, and so looking forward, and um, also being involved in many other things, which I've always done. You have to financially for work, but also just many other projects. I've written books, I've done talks, TED Talks, uh, illustration jobs, you name it. So for me, those are the solutions to, to keep busy and, and don't look back. Great suggestions. Mm. You've mentioned other projects. You've used your talents to document the red carpet at the Oscars. Oh, yeah. uh, the New York City Marathon, you not only ran it, but you <laughs> documented it at the same time, even caught Tim Cook's attention with that one. Mm, yeah, that's uh, exciting. You've covered the proceedings in Washington recently. Um, you know, some of these events aren't, you know, aren't particularly funny, uh, you know, starting with 9-11. With um, and they've been communicated to us through your eyes as an illustrator as a but first and foremost as a cartoonist mm -hmm. did you have concerns with your sort of traditional new yorker fan base whether they would accept this sort of expansion of your viewpoint uh, no i didn't um it just was a natural extension when i got my first ipad about five years ago six years ago i just was fooling around with it and found a program that you can send your drawings out immediately on social media and these drawings as you referred to are not full-fledged cartoons are just my reaction to what I'm seeing. So a, a drawing, sometimes it might have humor in it, but oftentimes it wouldn't. So I call it like a, a new kind of visual journalism. It's my take on what I'm seeing. Again, it's very little editorial except in what I choose to draw. So like at the Oscars, I've been for five years now, I've gotten to go to the Oscars and I draw, um, not only if I see a celebrity, I try to draw him or her. I also draw what's behind the scenes. The people setting up the cameraman, the, the, the woman painting the, the sideboard next to the Oscar statue, stuff like that, and the kitchen and the, and the um, dress rehearsal. So. And then political ones, I try to do the same thing. I think it's a new kind of media, a new kind of reaction to the world that people seem to enjoy because it's less argumentative. I'm not taking a big stand on what I believe. I'm just sharing. I mean, so much of cartooning is about sharing. Yeah, and people like it on, on social media, from what I can tell. Well, I love it. Uh, you know, you know, no, no one. Only person editing your pictures is and your drawings and your what you're seeing is you. Uh, right. And I'm, I'm glad others. Well, love then I sometimes c uh, collect them on Medium, which yes. is a blog platform. I love it, and yeah. I and I'll do a written narrative to go with those drawings. That's oh. awesome. That sort of fits within your advice of having another outlet. Right. Um, exactly. Right. Uh, for your creativity, for your ideas, mm -hmm. um, and and a place and a home for them. Uh, you mentioned there was an app you used to draw on your iPad in case any listeners are sitting there going, what's the app? What's the app? Yeah, I get asked often. It's a great app. I've tried several and, and they're all good in their own way. But this one is perfect for me. It's called Paper 53. And it's a, a company based here in New York and, and San Francisco, I guess. But I've met them. They're downtown. And it's a great app because it's very intuitive. It's got um, doesn't have a lot of dials and, and numbers and gauges and stuff like that. It has just a, like a palette at the bottom looks like an artist palette and so you can change the colors and, and the tools 
sort of an intuitive way, and I love it. And if it weren't for Paper 53, I don't know if I'd be doing this because it's such a great app. So cool. Thank yeah. you for sharing yeah, that. That and the Apple iPad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, heroes. Mm-hmm. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, feelings, observations on rejections. Um, so for the listeners to close this episode out, some suggestions on how to react to rejection in a networking scenario, whether that's applying for a job or requesting an informational interview or raising your hand for a leadership role or pitching a VC for funding. One, take time. Uh, Rejection shakes our foundation. It makes us question whether or not we belong, and we all want to belong and be accepted. Initiate plans with your closest friends or hang with your kids or volunteer to just do something. Take some time to boost your sense of belonging and being valued. And as Eliza noted, you know, have those other projects and have those family members and community you can turn to. Number two, give yourself a pep talk. One rejection does not wipe out all your other strong qualities and contributions. You know, think about what Liza said. Look ahead, don't look back. Um, Make a list of those things if you need to, of the things you've accomplished. That helps you get over that feeling of rejection. And uh, number three on our list here of things to do to get over rejection, consider what happened to lead up to the rejection. But don't dwell incessantly on self-criticism. Simply be aware of what you can do differently next time to improve your odds. I look forward to having you back here next week for more Build Your Dream Network insights. Till then, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Build Your Dream Network. Stay connected and don't miss a networking insight by subscribing to the podcast. And while you're there, I'd love you to rate and review the show too. Are you looking for more networking advice? Pick up a copy of my book, Build Your Dream Network. It's your guide to modern networking. I'd like to hear your networking questions, tips, and ideas. Connect with me via my website, jkellyhoey.co. You'll find links to all my social media accounts, plus a contact form to email me your questions. I'm Kelly Hoey, and I'll be back again next week to tackle your networking challenges.